the story of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is not a song of the Jewish people as one man, Israel. An idea that was come up with by a man, last name of Durham, a theological scholar of the Old Testament, a Christian. Now, it is the story of a man God calls my righteous servant who makes the many righteous. His description begins in three verses combined by quotes at the end of chapter 52, where God is the speaker, and then becomes <clears throat> the witnesses, speaking in the first six, six verses of chapter 53, also combined in quotes. The witnesses, who are Jews, identify themselves as ones of the many made righteous by God's righteous servant, saying, it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. That's in verse 4. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. It's verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 5. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. It's verse 6, but also see verse 10, where God chooses to crush this man with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. All of their guilt laid on him. The quotes beginning at verse 1 and ending before verse 7, ending with verse 6, identify the speaker of verses 1 and 2 as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured. The first, the first verse is, uh, who can believe our report or who has heard what we have heard and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And two is, uh, he comes from arid land, another description of him. And then it, it starts getting into, he was accounted plague and afflicted by God, wounded, crushed. And you get those kind of words. And it, as it turns out, what we have in the first six verses are Jewish people who have strayed from God's ways. They are not they, they are not observant Jews, and they're sick from it. They're emotionally sick, and that's that that's the guilt of verse ten. Will you take the guilt of the Jewish people who are sinners, and they feel terrible about it? See, this is his story. This is it starts out with six verses, and, and there's more verses to come where it's unrighteousness that's the problem and he becomes the righteous servant who makes the many righteous he's going to quote heal them by teaching them what they need to do by showing them God's uh, how God's using him that God does do the things he says he's going to do he said when he was coming back Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming when the land blooms again. See a time is coming when the ruined cities in Jerusalem are restored and rebuilt. In that time, see a time is coming, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. I will forgive your sins and inequities and remember them no more. And that will cause Torah to be written on your heart, which is a metaphor, And everyone shall heed me. A new covenant. Well, who are we looking for then? That would be now. The Jews returned after 2,000 years of desolation to the land. 1948. 
and they turned it into a beautiful country, strong country. So the time is now, and restored all the cities. Jerusalem is a metropolitan area now, far bigger than anything in antiquity. So where's the new covenant? How, how do we get it? Well, how'd you get the first covenant? Did Moses deliver as a messenger of God? Brought his laws and commandments to you? And everybody agreed to a man to abide by. Of course, even Moses, God says, violated the covenant. But he married the Jewish people anyway. In the book of Hebrews, this very covenant is discussed and they change that part. They're repeating what's in their Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and they change it from he married them anyway, espoused them, to and he abandoned them. So we have a new covenant in the day of the Lord. Well, how do we get it? Well, we got we got to have another Moses. We got to have another Moses and and where do we see some other information on the covenant? Malachi 3, the day of the Lord. There's only two covenants. There's a covenant of friendship and the new covenant of Jeremiah that has not been fulfilled. And that occurs when David comes. When David's here, God grants the covenant of friendship. That's the descendant of Jesse, the twig of the stump of Jesse, the twig of the shoot of the stump of Jesse who the sages believe, rightly so, is described in Isaiah 53, because even though it doesn't describe King David, it's the only description there is of a man to come. Just one. And that's got to be the prophet like Moses also. God told Moses, one day I will send another man like you. Well, Moses is known for the Exodus, and he's known for writing God's words, and delivering the first covenant to the Israelites. So that's that's how important it is, and that's how you know this is the time to look for it. This is the time to find the righteous servant. Described in Isaiah 53. It's chapter 11 of Isaiah, where it says that the sin of David will be coming. So you go to Malachi 3. When God says, I'm returning, we'll see a new covenant is going to be made. He says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way. And I shall return to my temple suddenly. And the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Well, that's the new covenant. It's also the day of the Lord. See, the time is coming. God's teaching is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sins, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, emotional guilt of others. No one of others can be healed or atoned for because another man or men suffer or are beaten or murdered or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? We know they're unrighteous. But why are they saying that the righteous servant has to bear it all? The righteous servant is, is made suitable for God's purpose. To be Moses, he's got to be made suitable. He's got to be prepared. And we learn about this in Ezekiel, which is the key to Isaiah 53. He became a prophet to the exiles. He was one of the exiles. But speaking God's words of repentance and atonement and not sinning. And God prepared him. And this is what he said. First of all, God seized him. He didn't crush him with cancer. 
that he would offer himself for guilt. He just seized him and made him suitable for his purpose of being a prophet to the Assyrian Babylon exiles in God's fire of refinement. This is what God says. But the house of Israel will refuse to listen to you, for they refuse to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel are brazen of forehead and stubborn of heart. But I will make your face as hard as theirs, as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them, though they are a rebellious breed. That's Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Ezekiel said, A spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness in the fury of my spirit, while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. That's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 14. God's going to make his head like Emmett hard. It's going to toughen him up. He's going to toughen his emotions up. He's going to change him. And it's going to be just like an army cadet. Going through training. <clears throat> a soldier uh, going through training to be a Green Beret, a Navy SEAL. It's going to be tough. And it's going to be done in God's power. Man doesn't do this to the righteous servant. God does. And Ezekiel is told, the same kind of words, is told he will bear the punishment of the house of Israel and the house of Judah which would be because of their sins. He's going to bear the punishment of their sins. And you have these same kind of words in Isaiah 53. And he is punished. Chastity, he's pinned to the ground. He's sent to his house. He is bound by the cords of God with his hands behind his back for 390 days on one side facing Jerusalem for the sins and the punishment of the house of Israel and 40 more days he gets to turn over to the other side. That's over a year being pinned to the ground. I suspect he was bruised and crushed, chastised, and taught the things he needed to be to, to know to be a prophet. And the righteous servant, of course, he's going to be talking to God all the time because he'll be like Moses, prophet like Moses, and God has to tell him, it was I that crushed you with disease. It is I who give you long life. So why does God crush him with disease? Why didn't he just seize the righteous servant and put him through this fire refinement where you, you're bitter and your soul and your spirit is furious in the hand of God? Why is that? It's because God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. He knew they were going to use the book of Leviticus, animal, sacrificial, atonement, and worship laws, and apply it to a man. So he blemishes him. He says, you can't use Isaiah 53 for that. But yet he put all these words in. Wounded, crushed for our sins by his chastisement we are made whole or bruises. It's because he knew what they were going to do. They are going to take the book one way or another. Just by, like they say in Hebrews, God abandoned you. But he put this thing together, Isaiah 53. He had Isaiah right. Isaiah couldn't have known to put all this together for the day of the Lord. Why? Because in Isaiah 51, he passes his wrath to the Christians, to the Gentiles in general, and Christians in particular. Those who told you to get down on the ground and walk all over you. That's in 51. The description of the righteous servant starts at the end of 52 and is completed in 53. That's what the story is about. So he blemishes him. And it's a man, he says, the man's a sinner. And they have ways of talking around that, the Christians do. They say, they say well, he was kind of a sinner and Jesus was crucified with uh, a sinner on his left and a sinner on his right. So 
he was counting amongst them. So that's that's all that means. <laughs> what? It's a descriptive verse. The man's a sinner. And he's blemished. And he was supposed to die, but it's given him on life. And that's the proof. That's one thing you would look for in this man who is accounted plagued and afflicted by God and shunned and despised. These are ways of finding him and, and saying, huh, this must be him. But how do we know you offered yourself for guilt to God? I mean, even the Israelites asked Moses, how do we know God's talking to you? Today, he would just pull out Leviticus and say, do you think I just came up with that on my own? God told me to write that down. And the Orthodox believe that God dictated the Torah, the first five books, to Moses. And it's the only thing that makes sense. I mean, they came up with 613 laws derived from those five books. And it had been impossible for, for Moses, uh, born and, and well, raised in Egypt as an Egyptian, to know all these things. And it says, <clears throat> just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Now this is in chapter 52, verses 3 through 15. Okay, but he goes on to be the righteous servant who makes the many righteous. He startles, he startles the Gentiles, that's the nation. And kings are silenced because of him, because they shall see what they have not heard, shall hear. Well, I'll get to it. I think I'm saying it wrong. Okay, so this doesn't mean he's a hard to look at. It's pretty much kind of describing his life and the fact he's been crushed with disease. Basically, when you take all those verses, what you're looking for is a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon. And God is in his spirit, just like with Ezekiel. God was telling him to get up on his feet. He says, at that moment, a spirit entered into me, and I could hear God's words. That's because God's in the spirit. I have a video on it. I did just recently. And he rises to the crown of God's righteous servant to great heights. How could a man today fit the description of the Lord's righteous servant in Isaiah 52, 14 with his parents marred unlike that of normal men and just so marred he shall startle many nations. There's one way. And still be alive to fulfill verse 52, 15. Start on nations. Silence kings. Make the many righteous. By way of example, to describe such a man who comes when the land blooms again and Jerusalem has been rebuilt, which began about 70 years ago, if I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents, surgical operations, at one time, before healing, together with my congenital disfigurement, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people. This is my history. I was born prematurely in the seventh month without the muscles of my right breast and with a disfigured right shoulder and withered arm. I would have a four inch wound from surgery to remove tissue above the missing right breast when I was two years old. I was small. My parents were told I would not live to see the next day. You know, I've been exposed to death four times in my life. My feet would have third degree burns from standing on the ashes of hot coals at a 4th of July celebration when I was four. My right knee would be a gaping wound from being impaled upon a broken glass bottle after being tripped by my dog. I went flying through the air and landed on my knees, and there was a broken Coke bottle stuck nose first down, jagged in up, and I impaled my knee and it came down right flat on top of it. 
I was 10. My left knee would be sliced open from broken glass. I crawled over playing a game when I was 11. My two front teeth would be gone, knocked out by a telephone receiver when I was 12. Each foot would be pierced twice by nails I stepped on at a construction site at the same time. Two in one foot, I jumped in there, and I came down the other side of the board and took two more. Went <laughs> completely through my feet. I was 17. My torso would be open from the top of my rib cage vertically down to the pelvic bone from surgery to repair a 22 caliber gunshot to my abdomen. On the front right side, which pierced my bladder, colon, and intestines and exited through my back left side, went through me from one side to the other. I was 18. My upper jaw, the teeth, gums, and bones would be severed from my skull from orthodontic surgery with my face swollen to twice its normal size when I was 38. My torso was opened again to remove an 8-inch malignant cancerous tumor that had burst through my colon. I survived the colon cancer with surgery and chemotherapy, but subsequent tests revealed that cancer had spread to my lungs and it was too advanced to treat. I was told I would very soon die. Prepare for it. It's stage 4 diagnosis. I have not seen a doctor for lung cancer from that day forward for any ailment. It was when the terrorists hit New York over 20 years ago. I did offer myself for guilt. Not only did, it, did he remove the lung cancer, he's given me a long life for this task as his righteous servant. And that's my proof of doing it. And what he's put me through in the following 13 years, and still continues, as he did Ezekiel, um, well, let's just say all my injuries didn't really prepare me for it. God and his power. Um, I was 44 years old, weighing about 145 pounds by that time. I'm usually around 175, 180, although I can get bigger. <laughs> the skin of my chest would be open from a six inch circular cut to remove skin cancer when I was 43. My left hand would be broken from a fall on a tennis court when I was 28 and broken again walking on stones in a creek when I was 55. I'm 63 today. My ankles would be bruised and swollen from severe sprains while playing basketball and running at various ages. My chin would be lacerated from striking at a wall at the end of a foot race when I was 21. And I would be covered with the childhood diseases of measles and mumps. This is how you can fit that description. And, and the Christians pretty much do that with Jesus, just saying he, he, he matches all these words that we see about the righteous servant, wounds and this and that, by him being scourged and then nailed to the cross. But then verse 15 comes and it says, Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silent because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. Now that didn't happen with Jesus Christ. And he wasn't exposed to death, he died. And he did not come out of his anguish. He died. The, <clears throat> the anguish is from what God puts you through. Eventually Ezekiel came out of it. And he was ready to be a prophet to the exiles. A teacher of righteousness. It's the same story. That's how you pick up on that. What you don't see is crushed with disease and an offer for guilt. God's purpose in that was he knew. And he knows all things. And he's not a seer. Nobody can see the future, not even God. You just can't, men can't do that. Because it hasn't happened. But God, in his absolute knowledge, he can go through what will happen. What will happen. The, the, the advancement of humanity. You know, from antiquity to today. 
So that wraps up the story of the righteous servant. Those who are sick from unrighteousness in the first six verses, all these different descriptions of him and his life, a lowly state, <clears throat> as though he was a kind of plague afflicted by God. But he rises to the heights of God's righteous servant. And the prophet like Moses. All these tapes I've done recently, uh, I think it's about 22. When I could finally uh, afford some equipment like Ezekiel, God took me from the world. He was cut off from the land of the living. That's in Isaiah 53. Well, that's what it means. Because man doesn't die. There's no crucifixion in Isaiah 53. The man's given long life to go help these people in the first six verses. That's what it's about. It's the Jewish Bible. They're Jews. That's what it's about. He knows the Gentiles are going to be set on their God. They don't, he didn't necessarily know his name at the time, but he knows he's going to be here. Jesus. He knows. That's why... Because see, God sees Ezekiel. He didn't have to do this with the righteous serpent. He didn't have to choose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. He just didn't have to do it. There's a, you know, so you got to ask yourself, why, did, why is he doing that? That's why. That's the answer. And he wants it for the day of the, of the Lord so that the righteous servant, as a prophet like Moses, can, can bring his wrath to the Gentiles, to the Christians. For saying that he murdered, had crucified, sacrificed his son so that the Gentiles, the Christians, <laughs> would be forgiven of violating his commandments and be considered without sin. God making a human sacrifice. The man's made human sacrifices because, because they feared the gods and they wanted God's favors. They didn't want it rain. They wanted fertility. They wanted good crops, fattened animals. And so they would kill one of their own because blood was thought so, uh, so highly of that if we're going to offer God anything, let it be blood. But what's God making a human sacrifice to Gentiles for? What did he get out of it? Except a bad name, a God who performs human sacrifice. And if you think Jesus just sacrificed himself for you, Christians, Read Hebrews again, because he says God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. And it's true. He did away with that whole system, told his people, I don't want your animals anymore. Stop sinning, or I'm going to punish you. Jesus said, he hath prepared my body for sacrifice for sins. So yeah, he's a human sacrifice. And... God performed it or had it done. He doesn't like it. That's why he's passed his wrath your way and he's using the prophet like Moses, the descendant of David, his righteous servant, who also handles the task of Elijah, the messenger of Isaiah, uh, Malachi 3. You know, there's four men to come. This is all that's led to be fulfilled in the day of the Lord. Two covenants to be delivered finally. And four men to come. But we got one description. No description of the prophet like Moses. Descended of David. Specifically, although it's believed he's the man of Isaiah 53. And he is because the spirit of light is upon him. And, um, and Elijah. And we have God's righteous servant. And he needs to be here and be able to handle... He had the capacity and abilities of all those men. Well, God's had me in his five refinement with his wounding, crushing, bruising, maltreatment, chastisement, 13 years now. And it has changed me greatly. <laughs> it has been an ordeal, which uh, as time goes on, this all becomes more accepted because I can't know these things any more than Moses knew 613 laws of God. He just can't. And he had me write two books. And those are my proofs of at least the prophet like Moses. I couldn't write them. I can't know all these things. If you, if you look at these videos, you have to scratch your head and say, how does he know all these things? And then add this to it. 
I was an atheist for 50 years. <laughs> and he spoke to me when I was 50. After I'd already gone through cancer, crushed my life, I stopped working. I just kept waiting to die. And uh, he tells me, I came to you in the womb, just like I did Jeremiah. He said, for him, it was to be a godly priestly man. And with you, it was to make sure you lived a life of suffering, full of injury. I tell you, you did a good job. That's a good job, bro. You know, when this, his spirit enters me, who talks to me also, and God is in his spirit, that's how I know these things. And it shows up throughout the scripture once you know it. But, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like finding Wanda. Once you know it, you can understand what a host of the Lord's host is. You can understand this concept of God being in his spirit. And it starts with Ezekiel. And then you say, well, how was he in the burning bush talking to Moses? Well, it says he, he says in the burning bush, the scripture says, the angel of the Lord was in it. But God speaks. That's because he's in his angel. The Holy Spirit is the angel of his presence. The Holy Spirit, you can find him in Isaiah 63. And Judaism doesn't believe the, the spirit of the Holy God is a person. Well, I can show you easily five accounts that say, well, yes, he is. And the first one's Isaiah 63. The Holy Spirit is grieved when the Israelites disobey God. Well, if you come, how can, how can something like this considered inanimate, just elements of something that is considered spirit, how can that be grieved? It can't. It has to be a person. The Spirit of the Holy God takes Ezekiel on a vision while God... God makes it clear in the story. He ascended from Jerusalem, leaving Ezekiel there, and of course his spirit there, and he went and lived upon a hill east of Jerusalem. As part of the story, it shows two things. The separation between God, who is one, and his spirit, and that his spirit is a person. Because the spirit of God takes Ezekiel in a vision to Shabbat. It's all over. I, I don't understand it. And the Jewish people are just too smart. And um, I don't know if it's because Christianity made such a big deal about the Holy Spirit that when they accept Jesus, uh, he sends the Holy Spirit into them. I don't know how it, 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 got, it got missed. I really don't. I don't get it. Um, but anyway, that's all I have on the subject. It's kind of a recap of all these uh, videos I've done, trying to put a whole lot from different ones together just to, just to have a big picture. What is this story about? Give me the big picture. Well, it's about the day of the Lord. It's about the new covenant that's here, which means what? All Jews are forgiven of their sins. But there's also an amendment, and the amendment is in Malachi 3, be mindful of the laws, of the teachings, I gave Moses an order for all of Israel. Mindful, that's the change. And tore on your heart, that just means you're all forgiven. I gave you a clean slate. Respect me. Start being observant Jews. Get back to synagogue if you haven't been going. Go if you've never been. Study hard, because it's important for the heaven I'm creating, which Elijah can tell you about, because why? The only man God took to heaven, specifically, and then sends him back. That's one of the proofs. And if you read my books, you'll see I know way too much about heaven. You know, assuming you believe the words. But it all makes sense. And it's just for the Jewish people. If a Christian wants to see heaven, he's going to have to convert to Judaism. He's going to have to become a Jew. And see, that's part of his right. Tell the Christians that. Just that. I mean, that straightening out Isaiah 53 and saying it can't be him. And there's another kicker to it. He comes from Adam. God does. Well, he couldn't pass through Adam in the Exodus with Moses because they wouldn't let him come through it. Why does he say he's coming from a dumb? It doesn't even exist anymore. It would be in Jordan. Gentile land. Comes with a Gentile. Because it says, and of the peoples, 
none were with him. There's no Jews with him when he comes from a Christian country. That's the arid land in verse 2. And that's why he's repugnant to the Jewish people. Not, not even counting the, the nations that he startles. And that nobody expects that. But what else? Jesus is a Jew. He can't be the man of Isaiah 53. And he cannot be the descendant of David from chapter 11. That's what the stump of Jesse is all about. My spirit shall light upon the twig of the shoot of the stump of Jesse. It's a stump because the only ancestral tree we have of Jesse is the lion of the kings of Judah. And he banished them. The last king was banished when, they, when Babylon destroyed the temple and was deporting everybody. Jeconia, he told you, no, no descendant of yours will ever sit on the throne of David and rule again. How does the New Testament open up? With the line of the kings of Judah. Jesus' line is the kings of Judah, the felled ancestral tree. The descendant of David comes from comes from a shoot that grows from the stump left over when after the tree is cut down. And again, I was an atheist for 50 years. And God wanted that way. He, he said, you're going to live, I want to make sure you live a life of something. He never talked to me. He kept me away from religion. He can control your thoughts. He can control your actions. And, uh, you know, he showed me in visions, more or less. Uh, you know, for this to be happening to me, you know, anybody would say it in the world. I can't believe this would something like it would have been the furthest thing from my imagination. You know, God just wasn't part of my life. I was just too banged up. I'm like a lot of people. I've been hurt too much to even consider that there's somebody up there who cares about me. And um, yeah, uh, heaven's just for the Jew, the righteous servant, prophet like Moses. Elijah, the sinner of David, is a Gentile. And what does it say? You'll see things you never, never thought about it and hear things you never have thought of. And that's what all this is. It's just one thing after another. But the books are great. I haven't gotten them published, but you can find where you can uh, look at them on my web, web page site for free today. Um, they'll get published one day. Because again, I've had a, been brought low. God took me from the world society. That means working. I haven't had any of that in 13 years. But uh, as a matter of fact, I got all this equipment to do these videos from the stimulus check from the coronavirus. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, thanks for listening. Keep all this in mind and uh, tell, your first, tell your friends. There's, there's some new teachings out there, particularly all of Judaism for the most part believing that uh, Isaiah 53 is a song of the Jewish people. It's not even close. Go look at the arguments of Jews for Judaism and outreach Judaism that they put behind this idea that all the Jewish people of the world are described in Isaiah 53. They gathered two times as the man Israel that was at Or, where to a man they were there and agreed to the first covenant. And then you can find it when a remnant of each tribe, all 13 tribes, returned. God forgave their sins also. They built the second temple. Well, the Jewish people's sins have been removed now, and it's time to build a third. Because God's got to return to it. If he doesn't, when he comes, he comes with utter destruction to the land. You got 7 million Israeli Jews there. You know, never forget because he's not going to do it personally. He just means his creation is going to do it. It's going to happen if you don't listen to a liar. If you don't heed him. If he doesn't recounsel the son of the father and the father of the son when I come, which means, which means his temple hadn't been built or, or isn't going to be built. Obviously, he had to come before all that to teach me, to prepare me, to deliver these messages. And he, everything I'm saying and have said throughout this uh, is at his direction and command. Everything. We have a perfect communication that uh, there's a lot to it. You'd be surprised uh, how detailed it can be. 
and how long it took to get very good at it. Thank you very much. Go read the books. Or go look, go look at the table of contents. Oh, the other book is, uh, the first book is Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord. And I'm covering a lot of the chapters with these videos. And the other one is the life of the righteous servant of God. It's my life. And he dictated it. He, he's my ghostwriter of my autobiography, which is really pretty neat. But uh, he's prepared me well. It's just um, we're in the process of getting to to the people who are going to say it, it has to be him. I mean, go look at the proofs he gave Moses. Just about nothing. He Moses said, who am I? That they're going to listen to me and say that, that, that their God sent me to deliver them from Egypt to a new land, a promised land, a milk of, of uh, milk and honey. Who am I? I said, well, you tell them my name. And uh, he gave him three miracles. He said, uh, I'll give you a staff that will turn to a snake. And uh, he said, put your hand in your, in your shirt, take it out, leprosy. Put it back in, leprosy gone, and three, take a drop of water from the Nile and throw it down, it'll turn to blood. That was it. And on that basis, he was able to convince 600,000 men and their families to follow him out of Egypt. And as you can imagine, they were pretty savage people. God hadn't even taught them how to cook their food yet with Leviticus and the animal sacrificial laws because that was a big part of it. Cook your food. Don't eat the blood. You'll stay healthier. Thank you.